August of 2023 saw the release of Blasphemous 2, the full-fledged sequel to developer The Game Kitchen's popular first game. It sees the return of the Penitent One, who, following the events of the first game, is brought back from the dead to once again save the world from the seemingly inexplicable force known as the Miracle. However, his new journey gives rise to various questions. What has happened to the world during his time of rest? How did the miracle return after its previous defeat? And most prevalent of all, what must he do to protect the world from its twisted blessings? In classic blasphemous fashion, the answers to these questions are told not only through character dialogues and cutscenes in the main game, but through item descriptions and lore pages from various items that are scattered all across the world. While this method of storytelling can give the world and story some depth, it can also make it easy for someone to miss some important details of the narrative due to how scattered the pieces of the story are. So, in an effort to understand the whole thing, let's take the time to gather all of the information together and present it here so we can see the full story of Blasphemous 2. Obviously, there's going to be spoilers for the game ahead, so if you want to experience the story of the game for yourself, now's your time to click away. Additionally, while it's not completely necessary, I will say that it's super helpful to be familiar with the story of the first game, specifically the events from the Wounds of Eventide DLC, as the events of Blasphemous 2 are a continuation from the events of the first. If you aren't familiar with or would like to get a refresher on the first game, there's a video on the channel where all of its information is covered, so feel free to watch that if you'd like. Lastly, before we get started, I want to give a big thank you to Team 17, the sponsor of this video. They reached out and asked to get this video made for Blasphemous 2, and being a huge fan of the previous game, I, of course, jumped at the opportunity. It is a little different from the first game, having three different weapons to use, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and having new options to traverse and explore the world and find its secrets, but it still has the fantastic, unique setting influenced by Catholicism in Spain, vicious, bloody combat that's fun and addictive, and intense boss fights that had me cheering in exhilaration when I finally beat them. If, like me, you're a fan of the series or Metroidvanias in general, I would say you can't go wrong with Blasphemous 2. And if you're interested in getting a copy for yourself, you can follow the link on the screen or click the link in the description to head to Steam to get the game yourself. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's get started. The story starts at the end of the previous one, on the other side of the dream and the land of the eternal processions. Here, the Penitent One and his ally Chrysanta destroyed the entities responsible for the manifestation of the miracle in Custodia, the omniscient beings known as the High Wills, who were not interested in saving the souls of the people of Custodia, but in harnessing their fervor to grow their own power. With their destruction, their influence over the land and peoples of Custodia was put to an end, thereby freeing the populace from the deception of the ungodly entities. This signified the start of a new age for Custodia, and unlike all the previous ones of years past, like the Age of the Turned Throne and the Age of Corruption, it was one that was truly free of the miracle. It was also an age that the Penitent One did not get to see himself, as his life was tied to the power of the High Wills, and with them now gone, nothing was keeping him alive in the world, and he soon passed away. His body was placed in a simple coffin and laid to rest in a cavern that came to be known as the Repose of the Silent One. Here, watched over by Deo Gracias, the man that had been his guide through his quest, the savior of Custodia enjoyed a long-deserved rest. Outside in the wider world, as the people live their lives free from the cruel punishments or twisted blessings of the miracle, Custodia began to change. Without the miracle, the churches and convents that used to be such a central part of the culture of the land lost their relevance overnight, and as a result, the number of their members dwindled and their faith began to erode. As the people stopped practicing their faith, they lost their memory of the stories and prayers that told of the miracle's works or its previous involvement in their everyday lives. Eventually, the convents and churches were abandoned and forgotten where they either stood as ruins that hinted at a long-forgotten past, or disappeared completely. 
Even the mother of mothers was not spared from this decay. Crumbling into ruins were all the once valuable sacred relics of Era's past lay in heaps on the ground. Nowhere was this decay more evident than in the knot of the three words, the once eminent symbol of the miracle in Custodia, as it now stood withered and dead in the empty halls of the mother of mothers, an indication that the miracle and the people's faith in it was truly gone. Even the memory of the name of Custodia was lost, only being used to describe a setting and fragmentary old tales of a long lost era. However, not everybody in the new land had forgotten the lore of their past, as there were still some people that remembered the influence of the miracle. For instance, at the site of a basilica that used to house the congregation known as the Endless Orison, a crown of watchtowers and temples were built so that bishops and other men of worship could keep constant watch over where the basilica once stood. The reason for their endless vigil was due to an old legend that said that after the basilica had been destroyed, a blue ghostly apparition of the building had appeared at the place it once stood, a wonder brought about by the miracle. The men of the Crown of Towers, as the Ring of Watchtowers had become known as, hoped they would one day be able to see this wonder and therefore proof that the miracle still existed with their own eyes. It wasn't just fringe cults that maintained this faith in the miracle either. There were people in the city of the Blessed Name, a large city that replaced Alboro as the main hub for the common people of the land, that maintained their faith as well. One day, a married couple in the city, dismayed at their inability to conceive a child, begged the miracle to give them what they so sought. It was a plea that should have fallen on deaf ears, yet somehow, some way, something heard the prayer of the married couple. Whether it was the high wills reborn or reawakened from the humble piety of the couple, or some other as of yet unknown entity or power that heard the prayer wasn't known. But what was known was that the miracle, as if stirred from a long slumber, answered the call and blessed the couple with a child. However, the child had a dual purpose. Not only was it sent to answer the pleas of the married couple, thus announcing the return of the miracle and vindicating the couple's continued faith in it, but it was sent to eventually become an icon of the miracle, one that all of the world could see and be united under, so that the power of the miracle, long since diminished, could once again grow, a continuation of the goal of the high wills. But its intention was not what manifested, as in the years since its defeat, the miracle had lost mastery of its power. While the main cause of the weakening of its powers was the years it had slumbered, there was also an implication that interference from another entity may have contributed. Whatever the case, instead of creating a glorious icon for the world to rally around, the miracle caused pain, misery, and deformity to manifest in the world. The corruption let loose by the miracle quickly ran rampant through the land, causing various afflictions to emerge amongst the populace. Most people were given a cruel, just punishment for a sin they committed, like a man named Casto who, after robbing an old woman that had passed away in the city, was cursed to cause the death of everyone and everything around him until he paid penance for his crime or a lady known as Susona, who, vainly believing her beauty to be unnaturally divine and that she was the only one worthy of being reflected in the waters of the lake near her community, had her face twisted and distorted by the ripples of the lake. However, while these sinners were deemed worthy of punishment, plenty of innocent people were caught in the crossfire, suffering punishments of their own. For instance, in Susona's case, any other person that looked in the waters of her lake also suffered her punishment, even if they didn't harbor the same conceit that she did, which resulted in nearly every single person that made up her community becoming as warped and monstrous as she was. Even when people were rewarded for their piety and purity, they often suffered some sort of debilitating effect from the miracle's blessing, like what happened to a sculptor named Montagnes. Upon seeing a woman die as a saint after trying to stop two men from killing each other, he received the inspiration for his finest work, 
yet was also rendered blind by what he had seen, which meant his sculpture of the lady would be his last. While the corruptions of its will were not what the miracle intended them to be, they still helped further its goal as once people saw them, they would realize they were the results of the powers of the miracle, prompting them to begin to worship it, which helped the miracle grow in power. In order to maximize this reach, the miracle knew it needed something more, so chose from those present at the birth one young man, himself marred by the return of the miracle, to serve as its witness. This young man would observe every single one of its blessings and punishments and share the stories with the populace of the land, leading to further worship of the miracle and growth of its power. The witness fulfilled his duty faithfully, but soon realized that upon his death, his testimony would come to an end. To prevent this from happening, he gave his life to the miracle, which built an urn of crystal and gold around his body thus rendering his testimony immortal and incorruptible, ensuring he could share the wonders of the miracle for forever. One day, a child, inspired by the stories of the miracle, made a long, arduous trek across a scorching desert, hoping that, upon arriving in the city of the Blessed Name, he would find a utopia of faith. However, when he arrived, he found the complete opposite a hellscape of misery and suffering, where the starving masses aimlessly wandered winding, dirty streets. The child's heart broke in the face of such desolation, and with tears in his eyes, he looked up to the sky above the city where he saw a cloud that, thanks to the colors of the setting sun, looked like a massive heart. He then made a wish that the heart that he could see in the clouds would become real and serve as an icon for all the suffering of the land, so that everyone could see the sorrow that he and they experienced, so they could realize they were not alone. At that moment, with that fervent wish made, something amazing happened. A heartbeat boomed across the city, and the clouds above coalesced into a huge heart, pulsing with crimson blood, where inside slept a colossal entity. As the people of the city looked upon the crimson heart and the being sleeping inside, they knew it for what it was, a divine child of the miracle. Upon hearing the wish of that innocent child, the miracle finally gained the power it needed to bring into existence that which it failed to manifest before, an avatar of its power which would unite the world in faith. It's the last chance to do so. However, the child was not yet ready to be birthed to the world, so as it gestated, the miracle, knowing that not everyone in the land would be happy to see its return, knew it needed to be protected. Thus, it started the arch confraternity of penitents to protect its new work, which was made up of some of its most faithful penitents. There was Orospina of the arch confraternity of embroiderers, who resided in the palace of the embroideries which, with the threads of pure gold that covered nearly everything in the palace, lured greedy pillagers to its halls where they were either consumed by the very threads they intended to pilfer, or they were hunted down and executed by Orospina. There was Benedicta of the Endless Orison, who, as a part of her congregation, honored a cardinal by praying over his body after his death, but despite having started centuries ago, was still praying over her cardinal, the result of her choosing to read from the apocryphal prayer, which locked her into a prayer that never ended. There was Odon of the Arch Confraternity of Salt, a fierce warrior who guarded a temple that the miracle hid in the sea after stumbling across the structure with his men. And there was Lesmes of the Arch Confraternity of the Incorruptible Flesh, a martyr whose head was stolen by a nameless girl that used it in a ritual to bring him back to life. To lead this team of guardians, the miracle chose the penitent that had been with it since the very beginning. Eviterno, the father of all penitents, who received the original penitence, which was to eternally contemplate and wait until the day came that the miracle needed him. It needed him more than ever now, and Eviterno, along with the rest of the penitents, answered the miracle's call, 
becoming the Guardians of the Heart and the Miracle's Child. Those that made up the Arch Confraternity of Penitents were not the only ones that were called upon by the Miracle, as the entity also recruited a number of other penitents to help guard the child and the city. Men like Rodimus, a confessor so burdened by the knowledge of the guilt of his peers that, after he died, ethereal voices sprang from his body, vibrating his monastery until there was not left but dust. Or beings like Sinodo, who was a conglomeration of all the previous pontiffs of the ancient land of Custodia, that sang with the voice of them all in the building known as the Severed Tower. To further safeguard the child, the miracle raised a huge portion of the City of the Blessed Name upon the shoulders of three gigantic statues, and gave to three of its guardians three regrets, which, so long as they held them, would prevent the sculpted figures from descending back down to the ground, thereby putting the heart and the child within reach of attackers. Additionally, in the Chapel of the Five Doves, the same church that held the body of the witness, the miracle sealed the door of the mother, the path that led to the highest point of the city, and therefore the heart, and gave the five keys that would unlock it to five of its guardians. With all of these measures, the miracle ensured that anybody that attempted an assault on its child would have a nearly insurmountable mountain to climb. And despite how impossible it seemed, there was one person in the land that took up the task. That person was Crisanta of the Rapt Agony, the Penitent One's old ally that had helped him destroy the High Wills all that time ago. Through the long years of the Age of the Silence of the Miracle, she held a constant vigil for any sign of the return of the Entity, so she could fight to prevent it, and upon the appearance of the Heart, she started a long, arduous battle against the Arch Confraternity of the Penitents. Eventually, she met Eviterno, who, having drawn divine power since time immemorial, easily defeated her in battle. Chrysantha stumbled onto the marble floors of the temple below the heart. With the amount of blood pouring from her, she knew she was about to die, and knew that there was now only one hope to prevent the return of the miracle. Thus, Chrysantha sacrificed herself running her blade through her chest, giving her life to consecrate its crimson wrappings with her blood, which would eventually give the sword the power needed to defeat Eviterno, and allow the one whose destiny it was to destroy the child to take the path they needed to fulfill their penance. That penitent was none other than the Penitent One, who, in the cavern that was his resting place, awoke from his long slumber and returned to the world. As he made his way out of the cave, he was greeted by Annunciata, an angelic being who had been sent by those that resided in the mountains on high, the holiest and highest of all seats. She explained why he had been awakened. The miracle was in the process of giving birth to a child, and he was meant to stop it. After warning him of the guardians that would attempt to stop him, Annunciata told the Penitent One to begin his quest by finding the Three Regrets of the Miracle to bring the elevated temples of the City of the Blessed Name into reach. The Penitent One then set out and defeated Great Preceptor Rodimus in the Sacred Entombment, and two members of the Arch Confraternity of Penitents, Lesmus in the Sleeping Infanta and the Crown of Towers, and Orispina in the Palace of the Embroideries, to encounter the Three Regrets, being taken into the Dreams of Incense after each one where he was shown the events that led to the miracle's return. After encountering the last regret, the great statues descended back into the ground, bringing the elevated temples back down to the city of the Blessed Name. The Penitent One then took to climbing their steepled rooftops, but was frustrated when he found the path forward was out of reach. According to Annunciata, he had to gain a power that would allow him to reach greater heights to progress a power that resided in the deepest part of the land. Thus, the Penitent One passed through the ruined halls of the Mother of Mothers and ventured beneath her sacred grounds, where he encountered and defeated the Sentinel of the Emery, where he was once again taken into a dream. But this time, he was taken to the Chapel of the Five Doves, where he met the Witness. The Witness explained the next step of his quest to him. 
In order to prevent the birth, the penitent one would knead his incorrupt tongue, which was locked within the urn that contained his body, and to unlock the urn, he would have to release the five doves of the chapel by finding the keys held by the guardians of the miracle. His new directive set, the penitent one found the power mentioned by Annunciata and then set out, recovering each of the keys from the remaining guardians of the miracle. He was given the key of the pilgrim by a man in the chapel of the doves who had himself received it from the witness in a dream of his own. He gained the key of Endless Ortizen after defeating Benedicta of the Arch Confraternity of the same name in the ghostly Basilica of the Absent Faces. He defeated Odon of the Arch Confraternity of Salt in the Sunken Cathedral to gain the Key of Salt. He weathered the scorching fires of Sinodo in the Severed Tower to gain the Key of the Council, and he obtained the Mirrored Key by traveling through the reflective dimensions of the dungeon known as Two Moons and destroying Susona, the woman that cursed herself as well as her whole lakeside community with her conceitedness. With all five keys obtained, the door of the mother in the Chapel of the Five Doves was unlocked and opened. And just in time, too, as Annunciata, who appeared before the penitent one after his most recent victory, told him that the pulse of the heart was quickening, indicating the birth of the child was nigh. The penitent one rushed off, and upon walking through the door of the mother, found a crimson rain was coming down on the roofs of the chapel. He continued his climb, fighting his way through the last of the monsters and guardians of the miracle until he came to the temple at its top. There, with the body of Chrysantha still kneeling before him, sat Eviterno, his final obstacle. After the father of the penitents called out to the miracle, asking it to give him the strength to overcome the penitent one, a fight started between the two. Although Eviterno was certain he would defeat the Penitent One, he was the one beaten, but the fight wasn't over yet. Eviterno drew Chrysantha's sword and unleashed the full extent of his power upon the Penitent One. But despite having the blessing of the miracle, despite having a peerless will to complete his penance, Eviterno was defeated by the Penitent One, who ended his life by taking Chrysantha's crimson blade and driving it through his chest. At that moment, the heart ruptured. Blood gushed forth and poured over the form of a cradled body. As the figure opened its eyes, looked to the sky, and was crowned with a ring of gold filigree, the penitent one realized he was too late. He had failed to stop the birth of the incarnate devotion, the child of the miracle. However, as was his nature, he was not yet ready to give up his penance just yet. He offered up Chrysantha's sword, and the wrappings fell away, simultaneously revealing they wrapped around nothing and revealing a beam of light that would take him to his final confrontation. The penitent one stepped into the light, and as he met the incarnate devotion in the clouds above the city, he listened as the child had an existential crisis of sorts, asking the miracle what the purpose of his life was and why, if he was a manifestation of all its grace and power, he was kept separate from it. Upon seeing the penitent one before him, ready to fight, the incarnate devotion realized this confrontation was the will of the miracle, so began a fight with the penitent one. Although he wielded amazing magic powers thanks to his divine nature, he wasn't a match for the penitent one, who attacked the heart of the child until the pain of his wounds rendered him unable to continue fighting. However, as their blood rained down around them, pooling at their feet and mingling together, the child realized what the purpose of their battle was. It was a baptism for them, and now that the baptism had been completed, he could do what the miracle had always intended he do. From its previous experience, the miracle knew it could not defeat the penitent one, as the will that drove him to oppose it gave him the power to overcome anything and everything it threw at him. So instead, it decided to use him. Thus, the incarnate devotion used his powers and their mingled blood to join with the penitent one, creating an entirely new being, a new symbol incarnate that would be the true avatar of the miracle, 
and would finally realize its goal of uniting the peoples of the world under one faith. As their new intertwined form rose up to the clouds above, the world marked the beginning of a new era for the miracle, a second psalm that would last forever. However, this was not the only way the story of the penitent one could end, as there was a way for him to avoid being used by the miracle and truly put an end to the ungodly entity. And the path to that end lied in the door of the father that stood on the opposite end of the chapel of the five doves. When inspecting the door, the penitent one could find a message from the father that read, Four envoys wrapped my body in soft linen cloths. In his adventures across the land, the penitent one could find, or have made, holy effigies of saints of the miracle that gave him certain powers if he equipped the figures in an altarpiece of favor he carried on his back. Amongst the normal effigies he could find were four particular ones that were the envoys mentioned by the father. Sierzo, who could be found in a chest in the severed tower after the penitent one's third trip with the Shadow of Processions, Haloke, who could be purchased from a traveling merchant in the Crimson Rains, Lebeche, who was a reward for a side quest that involved finding a woman's hidden daughters and completing her combat challenges, and Gregal, found in a hidden room at the peak of the Garden of the High Choirs, which could only be reached after finding all of the brothers of Proximo that were scattered across the land. Once these envoys were gathered, if they were placed in particular places in the altarpiece of favors upon the penitent one's back, places where they faced the center of the altar, then the door of the father would unlock and open, leading to a chamber with a stone basin that held smoldering embers. When the penitent one inspected the basin, the embers consumed the figures in his altarpiece, whereupon he gained the incense of the envoys, which, according to legend, would be used by the one who would perform the ultimate sacrifice, and thereby be blessed by the envoys, gain the ultimate forgiveness, and be guided to heaven. Thus, this time, after marking his skin with the ashes of the incense before his fight with the incarnate devotion, when he defeated it, the child did not come to understand the will of the miracle through the pain inflicted on him in their fight, instead resigning himself to never understanding his creator and dying before the penitent one, thereby bringing a final end to the machinations of the miracle. As the legend of the incense foretold, Upon handing the miracle its final defeat, the four envoys descended down from on high, wrapped the penitent one in holy cloths, and brought him to the holiest of places. There, alongside many of the faithful penitents he'd met in his journeys, he was captured within the ancient canvas of light and time as a reward for completing his penance. And with that glorious fate bestowed upon him, the story of the penitent one as well as Blasphemous 2, comes to an end. Just like its predecessor, Blasphemous 2 delivers a package that is unlike anything else seen in gaming, and that's entirely thanks to developer The Game Kitchen's decision to take inspiration from their home city of Sevilla in Spain. The setting, characters, music, and story were all influenced by things they see and experience in their everyday lives a rich culture that is rarely portrayed in gaming. To play through a game world that is so personal to them is a fantastic treat, and every member of the dev team should be proud of the work they've done. And they may not be done yet! After the good ending, there's an after credit scene where one of Chrysantha's wrappings floats through the wind. Could this scene be hinting at something? Does it signify a final end to Blasphemous? or perhaps hint at a new adventure starring Chrysantha. After all, in the crowd of penitents that surround the penitent one in heaven, Chrysantha is conspicuously missing. Whatever the case, whether the Game Kitchen continues the story of Blasphemous or creates a whole new adventure, if it has the same level of passion and dedication, it's sure to be a game that you can't miss. Now, I'm not perfect, so there may be some errors somewhere in my telling of the story, but this should tell most of the main story of the game in its entirety. 
but it doesn't cover everything. There are plenty of side quests that I didn't cover that help deepen the world further, so there's plenty left to discover for yourself should you choose to play the game. I know the story can be a little difficult to understand at times, so if after watching all of this you still have any questions or anything, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that every episode is uploaded to Spotify, so feel free to listen over there if that's easier for you. Alright, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching, and see you later.